Well, thank you very much. Um, I should point out to those of you here up in the north of England that it's bright and sunny and there's not a trace of rain down in Cambridge. <laughs> well, why am I talking to you about maths and sport? Uh, some of you may have heard the Olympic Games are being held in um, the United Kingdom in London in 2012. And the Millennium Mathematics Project has been uh, appointed, or whatever the right word would be, the official providers of mathematics and scientific education uh, to accompany the cultural program of the Olympic Games. When you sign the contract to hold the Olympic Games in your city, you are also legally obliged to provide a sort of cultural Olympiad and to provide educational activities associated with the Games, both nationally and internationally. And so I've given quite a lot of thought in recent times as to how one might use sport to interest uh, students and young people in mathematics and also how mathematics might show you something about sport that perhaps you didn't realize or understand before. As always when one tries to persuade people why it's important to understand uh, and study mathematics uh, the answer I usually give is simply that mathematics can tell you things about the world that you can't learn in any other way. So I'm going to pick a whole group of rather different types of topics uh, in sport which have some uh, unusual mathematical complexion. Some will be probabilistic, some will be mechanical, some will almost be number theoretic. Uh, so the first uh, is a simple question that you might pose to people on this campus at random. Why do tightrope walkers carry long poles? Here's a rather extreme example. This is Philippe Petit walking between the two twin towers back in 1974. And you notice, like all the tightrope walkers you've ever seen, he carries a long pole. Okay? Why do tightrope walkers carry long poles? If I even wandered around the Cambridge Mathematics Department and asked this question four or five years ago, and I was surprised how many wrong answers I got. Lots of people think the answer is all about centre of gravity. And they very quickly say, oh, it lowers the centre of gravity of the tightrope walker, so he's more stable. If you think twice about it, you realise he actually raises the centre of gravity of the tightrope walker. So this is not about centre of gravity. Uh, it's about something a little bit different. It's about inertia. So moment of inertia, uh, you're a sixth former, uh, studying further maths, uh, you'll perhaps start to learn something in the mechanics options about inertia. If you haven't, inertia is simply the distribution of mass within an object. So what matters when you want to move something is not just its weight, but the distribution of that weight. And in particular, the moment of inertia tells you uh, the extent to which the mass is distributed either in a concentrated way close to the centre or far from the centre of an object. So if you have uh, a hollow shell uh, or a ring, for example, all the mass is distributed far from the centre. Uh, if you have a disc or a uniform sphere, then the weight and the mass is distributed evenly throughout uh, the sphere. If they're made out of different materials, so uh, the densities are different, yet the mass and the diameter is the same, the object with the higher inertia, as the name suggests, will be the one which it is harder to move. That will move more slowly when you give it a push, when you spin it, when you roll it down a slope. So typically, dimensionally, the inertia looks like uh, the mass of the object times the square of its radius times some concentration factor, uh, a number of order unity that tells you uh, how concentrated the mass distribution is around the centre. And if it is concentrated at the centre, the concentration factor is small. If it's far away, uh, it's large. If we go back to our tightrope walker, uh, we begin to see what's going on. By carrying a long pole, sometimes you might even see a mass at the end of the pole, what's happening is the tightrope walker is increasing their inertia. They're moving mass far away from the center line of their body. And so when they wobble, they wobble more slowly than they would without the pole. 
so they have more time to correct and get their footing right. So you can try this for yourself with a sort of ruler rather like this, that if you have a long one like this, you can see the period of oscillation uh, is rather long, proportional to the square root of the inertia. If you did it with a, a pencil uh, or something smaller, uh, you would have a struggle to balance it because it would wobble rather too quickly for you to keep up with. Well, uh, that's the simplest example uh, of inertia that we see uh, in uh, not so much a sport, but more a sort of demonstration publicity event. But if we start to look for inertia in other sporting events, we begin to see the same type of effect being manifested. So here's Bradley Wiggins on the way to one of his three Olympic gold medals, and he rides a bike that's not like the bike that you and I ride uh, around town or campus. Uh, we wouldn't last very long on this bike. The first time you try to uh, make a turn away from going straight forwards uh, and there was any breeze in the air, you would end up on the floor. But uh, velodrome type racing bikes, they have no brakes. Uh, the wheels are always kept perpendicular to the ground, even on the bend. And so you see the prevalence of these disc wheels. So why would you do that? The moment of inertia of a disc, you remember, is half ma squared. If you put all the mass into a ring, the moment of inertia is twice as big. It's ma squared. So basically, by having a disc-like wheel, you lower the inertia. You get a quicker response if you drive on the pedals. Uh, if you want to cycle uh, on a road race, of course, you're going to have the same problem that you and I have. So what you tend to see is this hybrid system with uh, the low inertia wheel on the rear, but a rather more practical, uh, transparent, partially transparent wheel on the front to let the airflow go through. If you look around other events, for example, running, if you watch a top class middle distance runner, on the track, if you watch film of someone like Sebastian Coe, you'll find you tend to keep your arms rather high, like this. The reason for that, again, you're moving that body mass closer to the center. You're reducing your inertia. If you want to change balance, if you want to maneuver quickly from lane to lane or to move forward, uh, you can do so with much less effort than if you were running with your arms down like that. If you look at cross-country runners, you'll find that they tend to run on an uneven surface with their arms much lower because they're interested in balance more than making small maneuvers. So they try to make their inertia rather bigger so that if they put their foot down a pothole or something, they don't so easily fall over and move. Well, motion doesn't only take place in one dimension as it appears to for a cyclist. And inertia is similar. If you have a three-dimensional object, there are three different mass distributions. So for this little uh, squash racket here, okay, we have three different axes about which we could rotate it. This vertical one, we could lay it flat on the ground, rotate it about that, or we could spin it around this central axis here. Now around each axis, there is a different distribution of mass. And so there is a different inertia. And one of the great discoveries of Euler and the other applied mathematicians of that era was that if you rotate a body about any of those three axes of inertia, then the motion about the in-between axis of inertia, so the one that's neither the biggest nor the smallest, is unstable. So if I spin this about this axis, it will just spin. There's nothing exciting happening. If you spin it about this axis, nothing exciting will happen. But if I spin it about this axis, so on this piece of paper it says up. If I throw it and catch it, up is now down. So this has done a twist as it's gone up. It's now back up. I won't do it again. Uh, but you see what's happened. There is an instability for rotation about that central moment of inertia. Now, if you're a gymnast, uh, you would want to take advantage of that. If you look at pictures of uh, gymnasts, one of the things uh, that they try to do, uh, divers also, uh, is to change your body shape, to change the distribution 
of your body mass relative to your centre. And so if you're a little girl doing somersaults on the beam, uh, you tend to get more points and more credit. Or if you're a gymnast on the floor, if you do a somersault with a twist. But you can see if you arrange your body mass distribution correctly, you can't avoid doing a twist. So you exploit this instability so that if I run along here uh, and do a somersault sufficiently laid out, I will end up facing in that direction when I land. Whereas if I'm a high board diver and I dive in a tuck position like that, I make sure that that forward rotation direction is not the intermediate moment of inertia and I do not do a twist. In any situation where you're rotating, the conservation of angular momentum, as we appreciate quite well, uh, determines the angular velocity at which you will rotate uh, if your radius, if your extent uh, is R. And the most common example, of course, is ice skaters uh, starting spinning slowly and drawing their arms in. Angular momentum is roughly conserved and they spin faster and faster and faster. But we see this elsewhere. Uh, we see it in uh, divers, these Chinese divers here. As you uh, approach the water, you will come out of that tuck position, increase your body height and extent, increase your inertia so that you rotate more slowly in the final phase when you enter the water so that you can enter vertically and maximize your points and all that sort of thing. So all across these types of events where there's rotation, there is this play, this training that leads you to change and exploit different possible moments of inertia for your body mass distribution. Well, let's leave this sort of spinning stuff for a while and let's have a look at uh, 